Hi, we're going to continue with environmental chemistry today. Um, we're going to talk about now uh, water treatment and some of the other um, processes to deal with uh, waste. All right, so uh, when we look at water treatment, first of all, we need to know what are some of the pollutants that are in water. Uh, some of the primary pollutants that we see in water are going to be nitrates, which are, of course, uh, the byproduct of excess um, use of fertilizers that gets washed into the waterways. Uh, because you have fertilizers that increase the, ca the quantity of plants that can grow, uh, that can also increase the amount of algae that can grow, and so you can have eutrophication, all right, uh, which will consume all of the oxygen present. Uh, think about it, BOD uh, and all those kind of things. And also, when you drink water that has uh, excess nitrates, that can react in uh, the body to form nitrites and amines that can be carcinogenic and is also responsible for blue baby syndrome in which uh, the nitrites react with hemoglobin and uh, do not allow it to carry uh, uh, oxygen properly. Another type of um, pollutant that we have in water is phosphates uh, both from detergents and fertilizers and uh, just like nitrates it can cause eutrophication then you have pesticides, uh, whether they are insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, or any of the things that we use in um, agriculture in order to help um, produce uh, larger yields of crops. Um, we are going to see that their uh, runoff uh, from rain or uh, from um, irrigation can move those uh, into the water uh, system. Uh, most pesticides are fat soluble, therefore they can be stored in the body and they continue to increase the amount uh, uh, by a process called biomagnification. As you move up the, uh, the food web, um, a small animal or a small uh, insect may have a small amount of the, drug, uh, of the, of the uh, pesticide uh, in its system, but as the larger animals must eat many of those small um, insects, it will end up storing more of the pesticide. And so up, 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 and that could have an issue um, up the, uh, the food chain, whether it's for humans or also for other animals. Uh, another very important pesticide we uh, uh, pollutant that we have to be aware of is dioxin. Uh, the structure of dioxin is down here. It is a byproduct of a low temperature uh, incineration, and so uh, it's very very toxic. Uh, it can be stored in fat and in liver cells, so biomagnification can occur, and it has uh, very uh, large impacts on um, the body, uh, including the liver and the heart, uh, um, mental problems that affects the brain, and uh, it is thought to be carcinogenic. In fact, not only thought, it's pretty much proven to be carcinogenic. Uh, another uh, substance that is also present in water pollution is our, B, uh, our PBCs, uh, sorry, PCBs. Uh, poly polychlorinated uh, biphenyls, which have the structure that I have uh, shown you here in the bottom. Uh, those two are um, fatty soluble and therefore can uh, have uh, biomagnification. They affect reproductive efficiency both in humans and in animals and they can cause, um, be cause of learning disabilities. So, um, and of course, uh, uh, PCBs are also carcinogenic. Uh, in addition, I have shown you in the table that I gave you uh, something about the heavy metals. You have to be aware of mercury, lead, and cadmium being some of the metals uh, that you have to talk about and see what their health effects and um, environmental effects and where they come from. The sources are mostly uh, from industry, but also paint, both uh, mercury and lead were very common uh, use commonly used in paints. All right. So once we have uh, waste water, uh, we're talking about sewage. All right. Uh, we need to be able to remove uh, those components uh, or those parts that are uh, not really should not be in the water, and that's done in three stages. All right. And I'm going to show you the image, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to come back to the image at the end again. But I just want to really come down uh, to this image that I have here 
in which we can see the three stages of, of, of treatment of water. Here I'm showing you two. I have another image at the bottom that may show you a little bit of the third one. But the first stage is to remove most of the large uh, components, this large solids. So we pass it through screens and, gri uh, and grids to remove uh, the things that are floating. We can skim off the grease and oils that may be on the water. All of that can be uh, discarded. Then this is passed through um, the primary clarifier or the first, uh, primary uh, sedimentary uh, sediment, uh, sedimentation tank uh, which allows uh, for some of the larger particles to also come down. All, right? All of those solid materials are removed. So let's look a little bit more at what I had written for you guys over here. So you see primary treatment, we're going to try to remove the BOD, the biological organic uh, demand by anywhere between 30 to 40 percent, all right? Uh, so we are going to remove most of the uh, large particulates. We are also going to add uh, some calcium hydroxide and aluminum sulfate in order to um, uh, form aluminum hydroxide, which will settle uh, and help some of the other uh, particles come down by gravity. This is a process called flocculation, or you can just call it about it's ag aggregation. All right, so that sludge that comes down can be either put into um, landfills or it can be uh, put into agriculture, but we normally are going to uh, treat it, we're going to pass it through a digester before we do that. All right, the water that comes out of this uh, primary treatment goes into secondary treatment where we're going to remove about 90% of the biological organic, uh, sorry, biological oxygen demand. And this is done by placing it into what are called aeration tank. So we're going to have the water in a large tank where we have added um, aerobic bacteria and we are going to be bubbling air through it in order to allow for the bacteria to have enough time and we're going to be continuously mixing the water with its uh, organic waste uh, in order for it to consume, to oxidize all of those, those uh, organic materials. All right. After uh, that happens, all right, the material is passed onto a secondary sedimentation tank where the sludge containing the bacteria or any of the other solids is uh, taken back. That, that sludge is called the activated sludge, and that can be recycled uh, so we can reuse the bacteria. Some of the sediments are actually uh, also taken away. Um, but uh, now the water has, is, is pretty much close to clean. All right. Uh, one of the other things that is done after this point is it is normally treated with ultraviolet uh, light to kill some of the other um, some 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 of the bacteria left behind, and it can be treated with chlorine uh, and dechlorinated after that. Uh, in order and the water can be then now uh, passed on to rivers and uh, and leave the the the, the plant uh, in a relatively clean fashion. If we go into the tertiary treatment. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be removing uh, the dissolved salts and heavy metals. All right, uh, because none of the other methods are, are able to remove these ones. Heavy metals are normally result, uh, removed by uh, by precipitation. You react them with calcium hydroxide or sodium carbonate, or you actually bubble uh, hydrogen sulfide, and it will form the insoluble uh, hydroxides, carbonate, or sulfide. So. Think about it, if you have mercury and hydroxide that will precipitate, all right, because you'll make the mercury 1 or mercury 2 hydroxide, the uh, mercury carbonate or the mercury sulfide, uh, similar for the uh, cadmium and for the lead 2 ion. So you should be able to write uh, chemical equations for these processes. The phosphates are removed also by precipitation. In this case, you add aluminum sulfate or calcium oxide and you will precipitate the calcium uh, phosphate or the aluminum phosphate. Again, you need to know how to write those equations. Finally, the nitrates, because they're always soluble, you cannot remove by um, precipitation. You have to consume the nitrates. So uh, you can do this by two methods. One, by putting, it, uh, putting the water into algal, 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 algal ponds, I cannot say that word, uh, where we have denitrifying uh, bacteria that will take the nitrates and turn them back into uh, nitrogen gas, di uh, dinitrogen, all right? 
Uh, that process is time consuming and uh, so there's a lot of times we don't tend to do it this way. This is why many times this part of the tertiary treatment is not uh, used and it's just passed on into um, the rivers. Uh, but it's a problem because of course it can cause eutrophication. The other way to do this is to pass uh, the effluent, the water that is coming out of the secondary stage uh, after we've removed all the uh, other precipitatable uh, ions into what are called ion exchange resins, uh, resins or zeolites. All right, those will have these are resins that contain lots of either H plus or OH minus ions. And in the case of nitrate, you want to have a lot of uh, OH minus ions. So if you flow through uh, the ion exchange resin, uh, resin, the nitrate will be exchanged, taken out of, out of the water and exchange for OH minus while the nitrate gets trapped in uh, the uh, resin itself. All right. So let's look again at uh, this treatment part. So here is uh, what we're saying in the secondary part. We have uh, the effluent that came from uh, the primary uh, sedimentation tank. Uh, comes in here. We add the bacteria. We aerate it. We let it sit there for a couple of days. All right and then we let it precipitate in the secondary clarifier. Uh, this activated sludge is recycled. Some of it is uh, taken back and used in the sludge um, treatment, which is we're going to have what is called a digester. We're going to add some more bacteria. We're going to continue to break it down some more. Then we remove the water uh, and the solids can actually either be used for agriculture like fertilizer or you can go directly into the landfill. All right. Um, the water that has been removed uh, can also be brought back into the primary effluent and continue to be treated uh, through this process. The rest of the secondary effluent, once it comes out of the secondary clarifier, is where I said we're going to do the UV light and we're going to do some uh, chlorine, uh, normally chlorine uh, purification, but it could also be done with ozone. All right. Um, the final bit of, uh, and here's again, here's some of the, this is another image of how it's done. All right. Uh, you could have the, bio, the, the clarifiers and how, how we release um, the water into uh, a stream, uh, but we actually normally allow it to aerate some more. That way we can get some oxygen back into the water uh, process. All right. So those are the ways that we uh, use or, or work with waste water. All right. Now, if we want to produce some um, water for human consumption, uh, there are several ways. One is to take water, uh, sea water, and be purified and purified by actually using one an ion exchange resin in which we're going to exchange the sodium ions and the potassium ions and any of the positive ions by H plus. And uh, we're going to replace the chloride ions and nitrates and anything else by OH minus. The problem is that to do this in large scale, it is very, very costly. You can buy small columns filled with the ion exchange uh, resins, and you can actually pump your water through it uh, if you do going hiking or something like that, and it's um, reasonable. But when you're doing it for a large scale for a community, it is too expensive uh, because the resin needs to have uh, the ion that are being exchanged recharge constantly. Uh, a second way of uh, purifying seawater is to do what is called a multi-stage distillation. All right. So basically, you're going to have several stages of distillation, and in each state, the water is going to become purer and purer and purer. We're going to move it away from any other impurities that may be volatile, like some um, organic compounds that may be mixed in with the seawater, and as each stage um, of this fractional distillation or this multi-stage distillation happens, we're going to get uh, pure water, which can be then recondensed and captured, all right, and leaving behind the salts and other other um, um, non-volatile substances behind. The problem that this is for this is that it requires uh, large amounts of energy in order to boil the water, and so it is going to be costly in that form. Uh, the most recent system that we're using is what is called reverse osmosis, in which we have a membrane and we put the salt water in one side and 
we apply pressure. This pressure will move the water against its natural direction. It will, will move the water to on, allow only the water to pass through, making the remaining side uh, more concentrated. In osmosis, water moves from the more concentrated from the less concentrated side to the more concentrated side to decrease the concentration of the solution. Uh, in this case, we are going to move the water in the opposite direction. That's why we need to apply pressure, all right, to move uh, the water uh, to become less concentrated, so to become pure, and leave the salts behind and some of the water in that side. And it requires, again, it's very energy um, demanding, but it is less energy demanding than distillation. Uh, so in that sense, it is a better system. Once we have water, if we can, for, for example, have a, a set, uh, we have fresh water, we need to purify it, and that's normally done by either using chlorine gas or ozone gas in order to kill uh, residual bacteria and make it su suitable for consumption. All right? And again, uh, it is important to see the table that I gave you, which gives you the comparison of what are the benefits and drawbacks uh, of chlorine versus ozone. The biggest um, drawback for ozone, which in general seems to be a better, um, better suited for, um, for purification of water, is that it's much, much more expensive than chlorine. Um, but ozone is able to kill bacteria and viruses, while uh, chlorine can only kill bacteria. It also does not leave an aftertaste in the water like chlorine does. Uh, but it needs to be prepared in situ. It needs to be prepared wherever you're doing the purification. So you cannot just ship it from somewhere else. You have to have a uh, machinery to actually produce ozone in place. So that is also one of the problems with this. All right, both of them do it by oxidizing uh, any of the leftover materials, or organic left, uh, material there, and so it, breaking it down um, and thus purifying it. All right, so uh, we're going to stop here, and I will continue in the next video with the remaining parts of environmental chemistry. Thank you.